The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Alzheimer's Learning Day webinar for senior care professionals and paid caregivers. <clears throat> Pardon me. I would like to thank you all so much for taking time to participate. Uh, my name is Lakelyn Hogan, and I am the gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care, and I will be facilitating the Alzheimer's Learning Day. Uh, again, this is specific to the professionals in this field and the paid caregivers. And Alzheimer's Learning Day is brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a network of locally owned franchise offices. Home Instead Senior Care's network offers in-home care with an individualized approach to keeping your loved one safe and independent at home. To learn more, you can visit homeinstead.ca. Before we begin, I want to cover just a few housekeeping items. First of all, we have muted all of your lines, so feel free to go about your day if you're tuning in from your desk and a coworker walks by or a phone rings. Don't worry, we can't hear you. Uh, so. Feel free to go about your um, uh, days as needed. Um, we can't hear you on our end. And then we also welcome any questions throughout the webinar. There's a question box on your screen, so feel free to chat in your question. There's no such thing as a silly question. And as we go, um, you can enter your questions at any time. And then we're going to designate the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour to devote to those questions. So again, feel free to uh, give to, uh, Type in your questions at any time as you, as you uh, think about the content that we go through today. And then finally, we're going to be recording today's webinar, so you don't have to worry about taking any notes. Uh, we'll send this recording back out after the webinar today, and then we'll also post it on the Alzheimer's Learning Day website so you can share it with other coworkers that couldn't tune in or family members, friends, colleagues, uh, or you can always refer back to it at a later date if needed. All right, so that covers all of our housekeeping items. So let's get started with practical ways that we can improve care for dementia clients. While there's no cure yet for Alzheimer's disease in related forms of dementia, there is care. Today we're going to be talking about some practical ways that you can help to improve care for dementia clients, and I have two experts with us to share uh, their expertise. And before I introduce them, I did want to get a feel for who we have tuning in. So um, I mentioned that questions box. If you wouldn't mind just taking a few moments to type in what your profession or occupation is, we would love to hear from you. Are you a paid caregiver? Are you a social worker, healthcare professional? Uh, or maybe you're a family caregiver um, and you just happened to tune in today. We would love to see who we have joining us. So feel free to type it into that questions box. Uh, type in your profession. Uh, again, we would just love to know who we're talking to out there. So feel free to type that in at any time. All right, well, I'm going to um, start introducing our uh, our experts here, and then I'll come back and share some of the professions that people are typing in, because uh, I think it would be great for everyone on the call to know um, who who's with us and who's joining us. So our first expert that we have with us today is Diane uh, bon Bovenkamp. She is a uh, PhD and Vice President of Science Affairs and oversees all of Bright Focus's research programs and serves as a scientific liaison for the organization in local, national, and international forums, and identifies and develops new research initiatives, partnerships, and funding policies consistent with the mission of Bright Focus. Prior to her uh, assuming her current position, Dr. Bovenkamp served as a scient scientific program officer and science communication specialist at Bright Focus, and as a director of science information and programs at Foundation Fighting Blindness. Dr. Bovenkamp obtained her PhD in biochemistry from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, discovering and studying EPH receptors in angiogenesis and neural development in zebrafish and mice. She's completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the vascular biology program at Boston's Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, isolating and characterizing zebrafish uh, neuro. Uh, Neuropillins, um, and Dr. Bovenkamp conducted further research at John Hopkins University Bayview uh, uh, Promionic Center and the Division of Cardiology at John Hopkins School of Medicine in the Baltimore, Maryland area, using uh, 
different techniques for biomarkers detection in human serum. So she's got a diverse background and has done lots of great research. Um, very excited to have her with us. And then we also have uh, Therese, uh, and she is a caregiver for Home Instead Senior Care. Therese is a caregiver who has been working with Home Instead Senior Care for the last four years. Over the years, she has been assigned to many clients with special needs and conditions and currently works with three clients who have Alzheimer's disease. She completed 36 years uh, as a diverse, uh, in a diverse, uh, in many different um, roles, one of them being the Toronto Police Service and has trained over 200 members in various courses, seminars, and lectures. She specializes in soft skills training, including leadership development, instructional techniques, conflict management, communication coaching, diversity, ethics, time management, workplace harassment, and personality style testing. She's retired holding the position of registrar for the Toronto Police College in 2011. Therese is bilingual, fluent in English and French, and enjoys a healthy lifestyle with daily walks, cycling, traveling, digital scrapbooking, and a recent newlywed. She plays the guitar and is a 30-year member of Girl Guides of Canada, uh, which she has received the Ontario Volunteer Award for her efforts, and she continues to be involved in her church and her local community. She enjoys life to the fullest and brings that pot positive attitude to her clients, and she's a proud member of the Home Instead team. So, uh, Therese, Diane, thank you both so much for being with us today, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it looks like I was, uh, I mentioned I was going to go back to that initial question that we posed to our audience. Uh, we have a client care coordinator, a family caregiver, um, a resident service coordinator, or an RPN. Um, we have a certified end of life specialist and a hospice volunteer worker. Uh, we have a daughter of a patient um, that's at home, and then a social worker, director in senior care. So uh, lots of uh, a variety in the people that we have on our call today. So thank you all again so much for joining us. So as we go through the webinar, as we go through the hour, we are going to go over a couple different topics. So our first one surrounds the topic of early diagnosis when it comes to dementia. So my first question is, uh, what is the importance of an early dementia diagnosis and how does that help you communicate with families and treatment plan or care? So Diane, I thought I'd let you kick us off with this first topic of you know, getting someone diagnosed with dementia. I know oftentimes um, people wait to do that or they're afraid to get a dementia diagnosis, but can you talk to uh, the importance of it and talk through how professionals can, you know, encourage uh, an individual and their families to get an early diagnosis of dementia? Yeah. So, so I think that the um, what what the thought is now is that the earlier the diagnosis, the better. Uh, even though there isn't a treatment that you know gets at the root cause of Alzheimer's. Um, really it'll it'll help to you know so that you can coordinate with uh, family members with um and, and so that and you as a as a as a professional and and a care professional and a care worker can can help the families coordinate with their primary care physicians and and specialists and help to improve the quality of life and maybe even reduce complications so there really are more and more, there's better tools to diagnose. There's biomarkers that are under development. There are, are brain scans um, that, and and mainly, I think in the early conditions, you want to try and rule out treatable conditions like you know vitamin B12 deficiency, you know um, you know hydrocephaly and other things that that uh, and from infections and other things that that are treatable. But I think that the earlier the diagnosis. As I said, you can help to plan for the future, so that's financial, legal, um, just uh, general things. What are what are you going to do about work and the future and care? If you're not, if uh, someone is not currently living a healthy lifestyle, then you know you could start then. It's never too late to start. I always say, um, helping to increase the support network. I know that. Um, when someone receives a diagnosis, their whole world is turned around. There's a lot of stress and depression and um, having support just at that time, both professionally and, and 
and family is is really important. And just to know that, you know, you're not alone. And uh, I think that the other important thing, especially, you know, with the caregivers and professionals who are on the phone today is, you know, helping people to have a plan in place to deal with um, other uh, diseases or medical conditions that people could have at the same time that can be complicated by uh, dementia. Um, so like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, other things that you might need to remember to either go to doctor's appointments or take medication. Thank you so much for going over all of that. Yeah, you make a you make a lot of good points there about the importance of of that dementia diagnosis. And one of the big things is planning. Um, it really can help families plan uh, if they know that there is a diagnosis. They can get educated on on the disease. Uh, and Diane, I thought before we move on. Um, talking about getting educated on the disease, would you mind just giving a brief overview? I know we, it sounds like a lot of people on the call have a background in Alzheimer's and dementia, but could you just give a quick overview of how uh, Alzheimer's or dementia affects the brain and the different stages that someone might go through uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, so, so there's many different stages in Alzheimer's and actually the definitions have, uh, recently been changed or expanded. So there's now something called the preclinical presymptomatic stage, where um, this is where uh, with Alzheimer's, some of the telltale signs are some proteins uh, like beta amyloid and tau proteins that um, deposit themselves in, in the brain. And uh, some of those those depositations of the proteins can occur, you know, up to 15 to 20 years before any kind of cognitive issues um, manifest. So that's, uh, and then some people will go into the mild cognitive impairment or MCI due to Alzheimer's disease uh, stage. So in that stage, people have persistent memory problems. So difficulty remembering names and following conversations, but they're able to perform, you know, routine activities. And the the newer thing with um, trying to understand MCI and its relationship with um, Alzheimer's disease is not everyone who has uh, MCI will develop Alzheimer's disease. Not quite sure exactly, you know, the, the how that progression happens. Now, so the first, um, there's actually three stages if people do go to dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. There's stage one or mild, um, where it's early in the illness. And again, there's, there's memory loss and mood swings, um, trying to shy away from anything new. And um, as you know, people are still aware uh, at that point that they're starting to lose their abilities. And this is, um, people can become depressed, fearful, irritable, and restless. And then with stage two, eventually, this is where a number of the uh, more long-term um, uh, pro problems can exist in terms of um, problem, problem to remember routine things that used to be able to do. Um, this is where caregivers um, might need to give clear instructions and, and repeat them. And then in st stage three, this is the final stage where people become less and less responsive and the memory becomes so poor um, that no one can be recognizable, they can lose bladder control and uh, need constant care, maybe even difficulty swallowing. So as um, I, I think that, thank you for, for, for <laughs> that seemed like a long description of the, the, the five different stages there, but I think that it's really important as a caregiver professional to be able to maybe monitor if there's advancements, if someone has um, dementia, you can, always try and coordinate care um, uh, with, with the support network. That was a great overview. Thank you so much. Now we're all kind of on the same page, so we can move ahead with uh, talking more about it. But I keep going back to this, uh, the notion of planning. So once you get a uh, dementia diagnosis, um, you'll definitely want to plan as a family and knowing the different stages can help families plan along the way. And Therese, I know you've worked with uh, families who have a loved one with Alzheimer's and dementia, what are some ways that families um, can prepare themselves, prepare the living environment, um, and prepare themselves in terms of, you know, educating or finding resources 
for their loved one for that new diagnosis? Well, certainly working with the family is um, part and parcel of, of the care that we provide at home instead, just not for the client. And definitely it, it becomes um, an education for them. And, uh, you know, just protecting them in the environment uh, alone is, is important. Things need to change uh, as uh, the, uh, the disease progresses. And uh, re removing potential risks in the household. We all are very familiar with that, removing um, or organize the clutter. And many people love their possessions and getting rid of things is very difficult. Um, I worked with this one woman who had uh, final stages of Alzheimer's and she did not want this big dresser out of the way, but it impaired the the ability to get the wheelchair through. And uh, it was a big disruption. So we had to find another way to go around that. And the family um, had to be on board with that as well. I remember that we eventually had to leave the dresser where it was and um, walk her through the opening and then put her back in the wheelchair because it was so disruptive to her that this piece of furniture was was uh, rearranged. So certainly removing the potential risks, maintaining clear walkways inside and outside the home. Uh, we look for anything uh, that may be harmful to the, to the client, um, chemicals, cleaning supplies. In one of my client's homes now, we lock the laundry room. We have a key that is uh, placed somewhere in the apartment that only the caregivers know. And the, the laundry room is locked. Um, because of all the chemicals in there. Um, and they install locks, they install the lock on the second bedroom and also on the uh, other bathroom. Um, all the electrical plugs, we cover them up, um, trying to install latches uh, on cabinets and drawers if, if needed, if the client is so inclined to, to uh, certainly wander and look into those sorts of things. One. One thing that we do at uh, one particular home that I'm at is we disconnect the fuse for the stove. And when it's time for the caregiver to cook, well then we, we re-engage the fuse, cook, and then unengage it as, as well. And stabilizing furniture, that's another part of um, certainly removing the potential risk to the client. Um, and on the environmental, yeah, on the environmental part of it as well, you know, just watching things in the bathroom, installing uh, shower curtains and, uh, or sorry, shower chairs and a raised toilet seat, all those things help the client to be safe. And certainly the, the major point is communication, um, finding out and going in every day and visualizing, checking, doing a daily check to see what is in place and what isn't and what is safe and what isn't for the client. Those are some really, really great suggestions. Uh, There's so many wonderful resources out there and um, I know that when it comes to home safety, there is a home safety guide that Ho Home Instant has put out and families can access that on caregiverstress.com. Um, and we'll have some resources, a resource slide at the very end of the webinar today so you can um, you, can, you don't have to worry about jotting those down, but Caregiver Stress is a great site um, where that home safety checklist can be found. A lot of the things that Therese just mentioned, and uh, sometimes um, families don't think through those little things, uh, little easy fixes that could really, like you said, the stove, uh, could really save um, an injury or even a house fire in worst case scenario. So uh, lots of things to consider when there's an early dementia diagnosis or a dementia diagnosis, and when we can diagnose sooner, then these families can uh, involve the loved one in the care uh, decision-making or in the conversations earlier on when they still have the cognitive abilities to participate. So that's why another reason why those that early diagnosis can be so important. So uh, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, and we do, I did want to keep us moving along. So um, we do have another topic that we wanted to to cover today, and, and that is um, uh, improving care. Uh, so 
what can a senior care professionals or paid caregivers do to continually improve the care for their clients? Um, and so, Diane, I thought I'd, I'd turn it back over to you. Uh, are there any you know, evidence-based recommendations um, or lifestyle kind of improvements that, that families can look to, uh, to or professionals can look to um, when continually improving the care that they're providing to those with Alzheimer's or dementia? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there actually was, um, we can always give a link to it. There's a National Academies of Science, uh, uh, Engineering, Medicine, and NASM, um, you know, task force that was pulled together to, you know, look at this question, you know, evidence-based recommendations for non-pharmaceutical -pharm lifestyle-based, you know, and improvement quality of life. And uh, they found that um, there were some positive effects. Um, that there were three things I pointed out. However, it was supported by, quote, encouraging but inconclusive evidence. So the, the way the process of science goes, where people um, decide, uh, people publish um, uh, reports that, 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 that stack up evidence on one side and the other. But yeah, so these would be increased physical activity, not just aerobic exercise, but weight resistance. I think that's pretty much the number one. Um, blood pressure management for people with hypertension, and uh, a cognitive training, not necessarily commercial games, just something that challenges them if they, you know, like music or, uh, you know, learning a different language. Um, I do want to also point out that um, some, other, some other things that uh, weren't necessarily officially recommended uh, were uh, improving sleep hygiene, so Alzheimer's and actually other dementias, uh, so I neglected to mention that we're talking about dementia. So there are other related dementias like, you know, vascular dementia, you know, dementia with Lewy body, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, you know, some clients that you might have who have some of these other uh, diagnoses. But I know in Alzheimer's, there's a uh, quality of sleep issue and that can, um, and, uh, and then there are studies like the Rush um, uh, study in, um, with religious orders professionals in Chicago where um, it's been some of the evidence based that um, people with a higher social interaction network um, and even um, can have um, even even though they have you know upon their death that they have donated their brains and even though they had deposits of beta amyloid in their brain you know they didn't have the cognitive decline and those people who didn't you know, had larger social networks. That's what was one publication. And um, being bilingual can also also help in the educational uh, buffer that you have. Wow, those are all uh, really interesting findings. And speaking of bilingual, Therese, you are bilingual, so that's good news for you. You're already improving your <laughs> your lifestyle habits. And um, anyway, um, I did want to turn to Therese because uh, as a as a professional caregiver in the field, um, you probably have some great tips, techniques, um, resources for families when it comes to improving the day to day care. Uh, you know. Uh, Diane just talked about, you know, the importance of sleep and exercise and, you know, maintaining a healthy blood pressure um, and having social interaction. Uh, so those are all very important. But when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the hands-on care, the daily care, uh, if somebody is um, exhibiting some of those behavioral symptoms or symptoms of Alzheimer's disease that Diane talked about, you know, as they progress through the disease, they might start to become agitated or um, they might be frustrated easily, might have anxiety due to the progression of the disease. Um, can you share with us some tips, techniques, resources on how you um, or professionals can be more effective in the care that you provide by using those different resources? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, certainly. The, the main thing that I use, and I can only speak by my personal experience and, and the training that I received as well, is I come in with a positive attitude, always. Smile on my face, and, uh, and it, it's not a bother. A lot of seniors think that we're, we're, um, it's, it's a bother to be there. I'm, they're a burden. All of that, I certainly try to relieve that as soon as I come in. And um, uh, the clients that I work with, um, I, I 
I do my best to make them feel at ease. There are many things that are going around. Some of them are in senior facilities. Some of them are at home. Um, I have one client that it gets very agitated when there is a lot of noise, a lot of um, excitement, a lot of uh, if there's a dog barking, uh, music in the background. It's too much for her. It's, she gets overstimulated. So I know because I've been with her for uh, some time that I need to remove her from that environment. Um, and we calmly, you know, go to another area and just I continuously talk in a calm, reassuring way that, um, you know, uh, I'm here to, to be with her. Everything is fine. Um, and so I, I certainly look for those triggers with the, this particular client anyway. This is um, unique to her. And certainly um, if there's something different going on, if it's a different environment, there are different people, um, one huge factor in one of my clients is that she was recently moved to another room. She was completely agitated and, um, and upset and became very aggressive. And uh, the day that I went to see her, I, I had, you know, I was not prepared, but once I realized what was happening, that I was able to assist her in becoming calmer and um, just reassuring her again. This constant reassuring, lots of redirection. I find that if uh, a client becomes fixated on something, uh, a particular subject matter, it may be, um, it may be something. Oh, the, the, we had huge floods here in southern Ontario not too long ago, and that was all over the news. And uh, actually, their their home was flooded, so that became a fixation for her that she was constantly going to be flooded. So I had to, you know, reassure her that in the best I can and redirect her as much as I can about this, this particular incident. And uh, I find that the redirection into something that she's comfortable with, something that she makes her um, safe, uh, talking about her past, um, talking about her family, bringing out the photo album, to redirect her from all that fixation that's going on is, is certainly something that I use quite a bit. And looking at, at the physical in, uh, environment, is she too hot? Is she too cold? Has she been, um, you know, does she need a, a change of, of undergarments? Does she need a sweater? Or perhaps she's hungry. Um, I have a, one, one uh, client that doesn't want to eat. And when I'm there, I encourage her to eat and she feels safe to eat in front of me. So um, I, I try to pick up on all of those. And uh, working constantly with the same client really helps to know their behavior and what is, quote, normal and not for that particular that day. Those are some fantastic resources. I heard, you know, redirecting, um, removing them from the environment if that's what's causing some of the symptoms, um, you know, talking about the past, bringing that up, uh, making sure that they're physically comfortable, that their needs are met, you know, if, if they need to go to the bathroom, eat, maybe they're hot, they're cold. Those are all really wonderful suggestions. And uh, a lot of those um, I know that we include in our online family Alzheimer's training. So uh, Holman said on Help for Alzheimer's Families website, um, we offer uh, a free online learning course. And in, in that course, it talks a lot about those different techniques like redirection, um, that, those sorts of things. Um, so professionals can always direct families there to learn even more great resources. Thank you. Thank you, Trees. Wonderful, wonderful examples. And then we do have one more topic I did want to cover before we move to Q&A. And um, as we go through this last topic, if you're listening and want to ask a question of our experts, please feel free to type them in the questions box, and then we'll get to them in just a little bit. Uh, again, questions, you can type them in any time right there in that question box, the same one that you entered your profession in. So, um, all right, so our final topic, uh, revolves around future research. And I know, um, Diane, you um, kind of work in, in this area quite a bit. So we know that there's currently not a cure, uh, but everyone can help contribute to research. So whether you've, you have dementia or not, maybe you're a healthy individual, uh, people 
can participate. So my question to you is, what should individuals with dementia uh, and healthy adults that might want to participate, what should they know about participating in clinical trials? Because we know that um, it's going to definitely take some more clinical trials to make uh, some headway in finding treatments and cures for this disease. So Diane? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's something that all of us can do. And um, so if you do um, get questions from, you know, your clients or their families, um, I, I think we'll, we'll also, uh, we actually have a great resource, um, you know, clin of a clinical trials, your, your questions answered that, you know, if it has a lot more than what I've talked about here. But I think that there are many benefits, you know, non pharmacological or non-treatment related uh, that, you know, someone can feel like they're helping the cause of research. Um, participation may help others uh, who have Alzheimer's disease, maybe even, you know, one of your family members, and it's, it's helping to accelerate research. Um, I know that with, um, we, we actually do have on our website, um, we have a collaboration with Antidote who, um, we have like a little widget on our website where you can look for Alzheimer's disease clinical trials on there. Each of them, if you do find it, there's also clinicaltrials.gov you can go to as well. There's, um, el each of the trials have eligibility, so they may have strict limitations on, on who can enroll, but I think that they're always looking for participants. Um, for each trial, there'll be a, a different contact person there. So. Um, if uh, the family does have any questions, you know, they can always just print out that information um, that they find on the search and um, take it to their healthcare practitioner, whether that's their primary care physician, their gerontologist, neurologist, uh, maybe at a Alzheimer's um, disease care center, whoever um, they trust and, and uh, you know, make a decision with their healthcare professional. Wonderful. And that was a great site that you mentioned, that antidote, and we'll have that on the resource slide here in just a little bit. Um, Therese, I had one last question for you before we move to clinical trials. Um, when we're working with someone with dementia, uh, sometimes it can kind of feel like a clinical trial because sometimes you'll try a technique. It might work one time but not work the next. Um, so when working with uh, someone with Alzheimer's disease, how can paid caregivers and professionals create a more personalized experience uh, when it comes to the care that they provide? Um, and how can they create meaningful and engaging activities for um, those people that they're working with? Because we know sometimes uh, it might not work every time, but there's, uh, I, I bet you have a couple great suggestions for professionals. So, Therese, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I, I keep trying. You're absolutely right. What, uh, what works one time will not necessarily work the other time. Um, but I, I have to be flexible with it. And I come into an environment and uh, something has changed. Obviously, the mood has changed. Uh, she's, uh, let's take um, one of my clients. I'll, I'll tell you her name is Claire. That's not her real name. But um, um, I will go in and see Claire and she's happy, she's sitting in her chair, she's, uh, she's content. And other days I come in and she's curdle, curled up in a you know, fetal position in, under her bed covers. So I know immediately that something, I have to treat the situation differently. So uh, when she's uh, cognitive and sitting and I, I can carry on a conversation with her, um, and we begin again. She every time I've been with this woman for probably four years, and she still does not really know my name, but she knows my face. And uh, and uh, usually, if I can get her to smile, we're on the right path. But um, there are days that um, it's difficult, and I try to reassure her, especially if uh, she's in in a in a momentary or uh, in a place where it's not today or reality and um, so I just uh, use patience of course try to be as patient as I can I, I touch my patients I, I uh, caress their hand I will maybe give them a, a back massage if they're lying in bed trying to get them um, you know just a physical touch I find for me um, they do not get that very much and that helps me that helps me um, with them and getting them to um, to understand that I am there. 
and um, I don't argue with them either. If they they want me, if they're telling me that uh, you know they don't want to eat, and I know they haven't eaten for two days, I'm not going to fight, but I'll just encourage them as much as I can, um, and bringing them back to some memory perhaps that is comforting to them, and keeping them on track the best I can. One of the I one of the things that I do is um, I play guitar. I, I don't play that well, <laughs> but <laughs> I, play, I play well enough. And I, I sing some of the old stuff. And um, this worked with me. This works nine times out of 10 cases with this woman that I come in and she's in bed. And I'll just sit on a chair and play my guitar, start playing, and slowly she will, she will sit up. And slowly she'll start engaging. Hmm. There's something about music. I don't, I'm sure that there's probably a whole uh, realm of, uh, you know, um, a theory of behind music. But for this woman, <laughs> music is the key. And, um, and slowly she'll start to participate. And um, then I, I'm able to help her. I'm able to bring her to the bathroom. I'm able to get her dressed. I'm able to feed her. All of those things. That's the catch. That's the hook for this, for this client. And uh, for an, another client, it may be totally different. It might be hockey. <laughs> I have a client that <laughs> loves hockey. So <laughs> those sorts of things. So that's what I need to get the hook. And um, from there, gently. And, you know, sometimes we don't have a lot of time with our clients. We only have a set maybe two-hour period with them. And, um, and we try. We have our agenda, but they have their own agenda, too. We have to be very uh, aware that, it's not what we want to do. It's what, how the client is feeling that day. And plans need to be changed. If uh, we were supposed to go to the farm to see the, the horses that day, it, it may not happen. So, and uh, I find number one rule is you can't rush, can't rush a, any client with um, a senior, let's put it that way. And more so one that is, is not wanting to, to do what you'd want them to do. So um, basically, that, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Wonderful. Those are all great uh, suggestions. And you would mentioned kind of using the things that they like um, to help with um, you know, calming them down or redirecting them to an activity that they enjoy. So all of those are some great, great suggestions. Um, and Diane, I know um, I just wanted to touch back quickly on the clinical trials because um, I know that in Canada specifically, there is another site that might be a good place to refer or to go to to learn about clinical trials. And I wanted to, I forgot to bring that up earlier. So I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to mention that quick. Yeah, absolutely. This is my mea culpa here. I normally have been uh, talking to people in the US and so I'm thinking about the FDA, but uh, shame on me for not bringing up Health Canada. So Health Canada has a clinical trials um, uh, database and uh, it, it's not a registry but it gives people all the information about phase one two three clinical trials um, uh, but yeah all of the clinical trials are all the same uh, all the information that we have in our clinical trials book um, applies to all the trials that are being done in Canada um, the same same descriptions of all the different phases and and people will go through very similar um, uh, regulatory ethics requirements and uh, getting permissions and of course you know the same process to go through your doctor so uh, apologize for that thank you for that added information all right so I think we've covered all the topics that I set out to cover um, in this webinar thus far um, and so now I want to open it up for questions so we do have a couple questions that have rolled in but if you have a specific question for either of our experts please type them in there's no such thing as a silly question we will address them we're happy to do so. So please type them in in the questions box that you see there on the screen. And I have a question uh, for you, Diane, that came in. Um, how soon can someone get a screening done? And do they have to display certain symptoms prior to one uh, taking or having a screening completed for Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Yeah, I think that uh, um, really, I think that 
the doctor, the primary care physician, when you go in for your annual checkup, that might be a time to talk with your doctor about any, well, you meaning uh, the person who, uh, who, has the, um, who has a suspicion that, they, that something might be a little bit off. I think it normally rests with whether the family members think that there's something that's, you know, different. It's really off. It's not just like, you know, you're forgetting where you put your keys. It's, it's, it's something different with mom or dad or husband, or wife. And um, a lot of times that what it'll start is with, um, you know, like a, a cognition test. And if there are certain indications on, on how the answers come uh, from that, then uh, Normally, the primary care physician would uh, give a referral to a neurologist or a gerontologist or another um, memory disorder specialist, and uh, then they would do, a, you know, a battery of a test. And so, again, I don't want to be uh, culturally obtuse. I don't know exactly what tests are available in Canada, but I can, I can mention that in the US, I know that um, they just started uh, with the Medicare, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, that uh, the annual visit there, there's a certain like billing code uh, for physicians to be able to talk for a little while about, um, about whether or not someone has a cognitive issue. And uh, in, within the context of clinical trials, um, there, there are uh, brain scans uh, that'll actually help to detect those proteins that are uh, the beta amyloid that's that's deposited in the brain. So um, I think that uh, I don't quite know whether or not those are available in Canada right now. Thank you, Diane. Um, and we did have another question that came in. And um, so I'm going to read it. I'm going to answer part of it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Therese because I think she might have some suggestions. So um, how do you encourage agencies to send the same care provider or paid caregiver? My experience is that caregivers are always changing, and it causes much stress on my dad. Uh, so in this situation, I thought I could lend some insight because I used to actually schedule caregivers in a pre previous role. Um, I would certainly encourage you to talk to the care provider, the agency. If you are assigned a care coordinator there, certainly reach out to them and express um, your frustration with the changing schedule. Um, and also, maybe talk to them. Maybe if there is if, if you're a little flexible in your scheduling, uh, they might have a caregiver that's available during a little bit of a different time frame that they could put you with on an ongoing basis. So that those are some good starting points, uh, possibly for that individual who asked that question. Uh, but then, Trees, um, have you ever walked into uh, a situation where maybe you're meeting a client for the first time? Are there any suggestions that you might have on um, how to make the the individual feel more comfortable having a new care provider. Uh, any thoughts there? Mm, definitely, it is a problem. It's problematic when you have to switch caregivers often. Um, well, when I first get a new client, uh, Home Instead does provide me with a client um, profile sheet, and I read that. And the first time I go to a new client, um, I, uh, I'm usually accompanied by someone from home instead who knows the client. So if there was a caregiver that was uh, assigned to that client um, for a long period of time or a short period of time, that knows the client, he or she will introduce me to the client. So I'm not coming in cold. Um, and often there will be a family member there as well. So very rarely do I ever meet a client solo just walk in and meet the client one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes uh, there's a, a family member there, a daughter, son also there. And uh, so that, all of that helps. But I totally get the frustration from the family. I have a primary, three, I'm primary caregiver for three clients with Alzheimer's, and they, they get very disrupted when I'm not able to go. But I also have to separate myself as well and have have some time off um, I can't be there all the time I'm you know I'm vacation or other commitments that that come in and so it's necessary for having at least a, a switch off person that perhaps two caregivers 
that knows the, the one client that we can at least um, switch off on each other. And we always keep a journal um, on, on what's happening with the client, uh, what happened that day. Uh, that helps immensely to know what, what happened yesterday or what happened, you know, two hours ago. Um, so I get the frustration. I, too, like it when I'm there. I, I'm the primary caregiver because I know what happened yesterday. I was here yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have a client every day at the same time, Monday to Friday. And, and so um, you, you develop a pattern, you develop a routine, and you know what's happening. If I only see that, care, uh, that client once a week and there are four other caregivers in there, he also gets confused about who are you. Right. And but um, I can say, don't you remember yesterday? This is what we did. We went to the library. Do you remember? And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that helps. It helps a lot. But it's difficult to, unless it's a full time position um, to, to stay, you know, to be committed to one client all the time. And also it it sometimes becomes a problem for the family because they want only you. They want only me to attend. And if I'm not available, I try to switch my schedule or accommodate. If I can, I do, but sometimes it's not possible. And then the family becomes frustrated because I'm not available. So it's, um, it's a situation that happens a lot. It would be wonderful if, if everybody could just stay with the same client all the time so that there's continuity, um, you know, just Knowing where the garbage goes sometimes is a problem, but if you're there every day, then um, it's not an issue. But good question. Thank you. Yeah, that is a good question. And uh, when you say that sometimes you need a break, when we're working with family caregivers, um, they need a break too. So having respite, having some an alternate family member or maybe a paid caregiver uh, that can come in that the person is familiar with can be very helpful. And another part that you, you brought up that I thought was a good suggestion is keeping some sort of a journal or record. Uh, so if this, this, in this individual situation, if there are multiple caregivers coming through, if all of the caregivers are recording things in the journal, uh, making notes about what they ate yesterday or if they were in a bad mood yesterday or something was uh, they tried an intervention like redirecting to a favorite TV show and it was very successful. They could write little notes like that in the journal so that the caregiver, if they are new, can read back through that and use some of those techniques um, to hopefully create a, a little more continuity in the care. So that could be another suggestion uh, for the person that wrote in. So great information shared. Um, I have another question that came in. Uh, and, and Diane, this one's more for you. Um, are the beta amyloids, this is, I'm going to read this slowly so you can catch all of it. So are the beta amyloids only related to Alzheimer's? I'm wondering if similar on um, brain scans, uh, relate to MS, possibly early stages, um, or is it completely different? Does, did you catch that? Sorry. Um, so basically are, are beta amyloids only related to Alzheimer's? Yeah. I think that the answer would, to that would be, the simple answer is no. I think that both the tau proteins and the beta amyloid proteins, as I was talking about it, uh, the related dementias, there's other dementias where these proteins can be deposited in the brain. A lot of times, you know, as they were, the person asking the question was mentioning, could be um, deposited in different ways. Um, I know that, uh, you know, for example, I was mentioning, uh, if we talk about another protein, the tau protein, um, there's a tau protein that's deposited in the brains of people with, um, who have dementia with Lewy body and, you know, as, as well as, uh, um, as people who have Alzheimer's and there's other tauopathies and yeah. So I think that just the there, there have been, uh, there's BRA, what they call BRAC staging. Uh, there's a scientific publication by doctors BRAC, BRAC and BRAC, and um, they kind of define the initiation and the spreading of how the beta amyloid is depositing in the brain. So yeah, so that there's a particular pattern and spreading that happens with Alzheimer's that, that you know, I'm not a 
a medical doctor per se, but I think that that's what um, specialists will use for, for their diagnosis, as part of their diagnosis. Because of course you need to have the clinical symptoms as well. Some people have amyloid in their brains and never ever develop dementia in their lives. So it's just this mystery that's not known yet why. That's very interesting. So much more we can learn, and, uh, and that's why those clinical trials, I think, are so important. But um, we have another question. So, and Diane, you might know the answer to this. Is there any uh, recent legislation or policy in Canada uh, that pertains to dementia care or um, resources for families? Absolutely. I think that uh, what's really exciting just on June 22nd this year uh, was the passing of Bill C-233, and um, this, you know, helped launch Canada to become the 30th country uh, to have a national dementia strategy. Um, and uh, not only, like for all those listening, not only is it, you know, uh, giving a national strategy for the research, but also, you know, a path forward to try and coordinate care and uh, you know, better coordination of the research, management of the, uh, just management of the care and improving quality of life. So um, we can always provide a link to that um, in, in the resources afterwards. Um, or, um, but you can always just, uh, just Google Canada's National Dementia Strategy and you can get more information on that. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have another question that just came in. Um, if the client has a difficult transition into care, will they ever get through it? My mom has had a difficult transition. After three weeks in care, she was sent to the hospital for assessment for a period of five weeks. Is there hope that she will be accepting of, uh, will accept being in care? And uh, it's kind of hard to tell what kind of care exactly, but maybe she went into a care community or living community, or maybe she had care coming into the home and had difficulty accepting it. We know that that can be common. Um, Therese, do you have any experience of going through that transition with a client from maybe a home to a community? Or um, have you ever worked with a client that didn't really want you there? And how did you address that? Are there any suggestions you can give on making that transition smoother for families? Yes, uh, it's happened to me. Um, they don't want you there. Um, uh, I had a client, um, elderly woman. She had probably first first level dementia as well, and she just kept telling me to get out, to get out. She didn't want me there. Um, she didn't need me, and I just said, "Well, you know, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to sit here, and I'm just going to keep you company." And um, slowly, you know, I tried to use a sense of humor as well, positive attitude, all of that to, to minimize it. It's not, it's not um, such a severe, severe problem, in my opinion. You know, I have to have lightheartedness about it. If I was to leave every time somebody told me to get out, <laughs> I would have gone a lot. Um, so I just said, well, you know, I'm just going to do the dishes, and then maybe I'll, if you still want me to leave, I'll leave. Or uh, why don't we just watch the news and and then if you still want me to leave, I'll leave. And um, it happens. It, it happens that way. That uh, I think it's about the acceptance. The acceptance. I have a client at the moment, and it's not so much the client himself, but the family. The family are having a lot of difficulty accepting the father's condition. Um, um, this this gentleman is probably second stage dementia and um, needs constant care. And um, the family are having a difficult time with it um, as far as knowing what to do. And they're not uh, accepting of the fact that he needs um, more advanced care, such as in a, a, a nursing home facility. And they're not accepting of that. So sometimes my job is to be with, be with the family and, and help them there, educate them, to tell them that there are resources, that they're not alone. They're not the only ones going through this. Um, there is uh, lots, of, lots of care available, home instead. Of, um, for one, we have Canada, in Canada here, we have CCAC that will come and assess the situation. 
So sometimes it's just not the client. It's the family that we deal with as well that, that needs some guidance, that needs to, to know that they're, you know, we're here for them and we'll help them through the transition of this disease, which is progressive. It progresses sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. So it's, um, it, it's educating and being compassionate to the family as well because they have their own suffering. They have their own pain. Personally, myself, my mother um, went through the same thing. And, um, you know, it was difficult. There were seven of us in the family, and it was hard to agree. It was hard to agree on her care. And um, eventually, you know, someone had to make the decision. And it causes um, ripples in the, in the family because someone is now sick. Something has changed. So I guess the answer to the question that we just do what we can. We offer resources. We leave pamphlets. We give phone numbers. And, um, you know, redirect as much as we can to help the clients as well as the family members who love them so much. Thank you for sharing those tips. Those, I, If I were a family member in distress, I would want you to walk through my door. So you, you, you seem <laughs> so <too>. compassionate. <laughs> Like we want to just clone trees and have her, you know, go to every home. Wouldn't that be fabulous? Well, and and trees. One thing important that you mentioned is offering resources to families. Uh, that's one key thing that we can do as professionals in this field is connect families with resources. So before we move on to our very last question, I did want to pull up our resources slide, all the resources we've been mentioning here in today's webinar. Um, and then I'm going to ask just one more question. Um, and Diane, this is probably one for you. You'd mentioned the importance of good sleep. Many older adults having have trouble with sleep. So what recommend, recommendations might you have in this area? We know sleep is so important. So how can families encourage sleep or are there suggestions that you can make? Yeah, it, it is this kind of like this cyclical situation because the disease can, I guess, depending on what centers in the brain it deposits and, and it, it can cause sleep issues. Um, but then also anxiety can cause the sleep issues as well. I think that, um, it might have to have to do do a lot of the same things that you would to improve your own sleep hygiene that I probably need to listen to myself. You know, you you try and do stress reduction. Um, you know, help help people uh, meditate. Try and as caregivers, I would and and professionals try and maintain the exact. You know, try and maintain a regular sleep wake cycle, and because um, there really is a, is a cycle. Um, and uh, and and I think that there is this um, phenomenon called sundowning, um, where people near the end of the day can get really agitated. And I'm sure Therese can talk more about this on on, on how you can do to what you can do to to, to help help calm people down. But I do know as a care caregiver, um, if you're walking into the house at that time when someone is maybe going through the, the sundowning and feeling agitated and you can just maybe try and realize that and uh, kind of put that into your to your plan care. Absolutely. Thank you for that suggestion. And I know that um yeah, in the in the caregiving situation or the paid caregiver situation, there's probably tricks of the trade for that in, the encouragement of sleeping. So, Therese, do you have any final tips for us on how to get someone to sleep or um, any tips on how to make that um, transition into the bedtime routine easier? Well, we start early. We start early. We give lots of warnings. I, uh, I I give lots of warning. If, if bedtime's 10 o'clock, then, you know, 8.30, I kind of start. And, uh, it, you know, if you have the time, right, if you're just going to be put into a situation where you have one hour to be with the client and put that person to bed, it's not a lot of time. But if you're, you have the luxury of a couple of hours being with that person, maybe after supper, and then going through the sundowning period is I, I totally get it. I had a client um, that was highly agitated during this time. And, um, and that, that was the client that I used the guitar with. <laughs> anyway, we start early. We have, a, we have a routine. 
right? So we're going to watch the news, and after the news, we're going to take our shower. And okay, and lots of times they'll fight. No, I don't want to take my shower. Well, we had agreed that we're going to take a shower now, or and then just start early. And um, and I'll I've I've had it happen a lot that the the client does not want to go to bed, and um, they 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 become very defiant. But it's again persistence and just you know using uh, a, a calm voice and being just gently saying you know we agreed on this. Do you remember we agreed? Sometimes they don't, but um, time to go to bed. If I can give them something to look forward to tomorrow, tomorrow your daughter is coming, and you need to get some sleep or uh, something like that. Or tomorrow uh, you're getting your hair done tomorrow, so you need to have your sleep um, or anything that works we have you know many of us have tricks in our pockets i guess but uh, those sorts of things helped me and uh, eventually um you know um uh, you know i get the client to sleep but i there's anything that one thing that works with one does not necessarily work with another but it is a it is a problem many caregivers face for sure thank you for those suggestions yeah it sounds like you can kind of draw from that individuals um, past or uh, their particularly particular likes and preferences to to encourage sleep. So unfortunately, we're out of time. We've had so much good information. I wish we could keep talking and talking, but uh, I do want to remind you that this webinar, the recording of it, will be available on allslearn.ca, uh, and then it'll also be sent back out to you via email. And then we also. Uh, you know, the whole Alzheimer's Learning Day is about educating, sharing, um, and learning. So we want you to share what you've learned on today's webinar. Uh, so if you want to promote this on social media or share your favorite fact or tidbit that you got took away from today's webinar, please use the hashtag ALZ Learning Day 2017. Um, and a big thank you to, Di uh, to Diane and Therese for joining us today. Um, you guys are such a wealth of knowledge. Both of you women are a wealth of knowledge and definitely experts in your field. So thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. You so My much. pleasure. Yeah, I really enjoyed Are, myself. Oh, good, good. Well, we enjoyed it too. And thank you all of you uh, for tuning in today. Thank you so much for the work you do as professionals, caring for individuals with Alzheimer's and uh, other dementias and supporting their families as they go through this. As we know it's not easy uh, and the work that all of you do is extremely important. So thank you so much. Thank you for participating in Alzheimer's Learning Day and we hope to connect with you again sometime soon. Take good care. Have a great day. Bye.